Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. For the foreseeable future, you're not going to hear our normal intro or outro here. We're going to be releasing episodes very frequently as things are changing. This channel will be used for a very specific purpose. Number one, to communicate with our patients. We're somewhat overwhelmed, and the more we can communicate breaking news and recommendations from us to our patients all at once, the better. So if you're a patient, we're here for you if you need us. But if possible, please tune in here so we can both keep you up to date and conserve our time for the most critical tasks. Feel free to share this with friends and colleagues as well. Number two, We've organized as a group. We have infectious disease specialists, ER doctors, critical care doctors, and in total dozens of MDs, PhDs, and frontline clinicians who are going to be constantly evaluating the news and emerging evidence. We're then going to summarize and translate that for you here every day on the podcast. The speed of change with the circumstances will make us look foolish at times, but we're committed to pouring all of our resources and energy into doing what we can to help and make a difference. You can also follow our updates at wildhealth.com or our Instagram account at wildhealthmd. And if you're a patient, we're here for you. Please tune in here for the updates and let us know how we can help. Good evening. Today is March 26th, Thursday. And today's update, uh, this morning actually we released a podcast with Dr. David Sinclair. Dr. Sinclair is a brilliant scientist whose opinion you should be listening to. So if you haven't listened to that, uh, take a listen to that. We're very excited to have Dr. Sinclair on. Today, the CDC reports that as of Wednesday evening, which was yesterday evening, there are 68,000 cases and 994 deaths in the U.S., This represents a 26% increase in cases and a 35% increase in deaths since the previous day. The case fatality rate is 1.45%. It has remained below 1.5% over the past week. As of this afternoon, the John Hopkins database reports 69,684 cases and over 1,000 deaths in the United States. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And in global updates, there's data from the Financial Times that shows that the U.S. death toll has steepened, surpassing Iran's number of deaths at the same stage, but remaining behind Italy and China. So the U.S. continues to have more reported cases than any other country did at the same stage. That's data from yesterday, March 25th at 3 p.m., In U.S. news, um, we've got new hotspots being identified all the time. Louisiana is now experiencing the fastest growth in new cases in the entire world, with a current trajectory similar to Spain and Italy. New Orleans alone reported 827 cases on Wednesday night, which is more than statewide totals. And it it may be important to just talk a little bit about why here. Um, We think we're just hypothesizing that this could be due to Mardi Gras, which was not that long ago, and really large gatherings. So again, this is speculation, but it just points to the need for social distancing or physical distancing, as we should be saying. Yeah, and in yet another really populated area, New York City, uh, medical facilities are beginning to face the shortages that we've been warned about in countries like Italy. All of the city's 1,800 ICU beds are expected to be full by Friday, according to a emergency briefing from FEMA. So that's somewhat uh, unfortunate. That's tomorrow. Um, multiple early reports also indicate that recovering from the virus does provide some semblance of immunity to subsequent infections. Now, we don't know how long that immunity is going to last or remain, but either way, this is a really, really good sign um, as growing herd immunity in the community could allow some people to return to work and recovered healthcare workers to remain in the field. But the pandemic itself um, will need to see this kind of immunity in order to slow the risk of community transmission. And there's some reports out that uh, we're really close to getting a rapid test to see who is immune and who isn't. So that's going to be really helpful if we can get that to just to say, okay, who are our frontline workers and healthcare workers who could go back on the job and really provide care to those? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, The other thing with immunity is it can point to new treatments such as antibodies from these recovered patients um, that can be used to aid in those infected. In fact, the FDA has actually approved the use of plasma from recovered patients to treat some more severe cases. Uh, This is pretty preliminary, though. Um, New York announced that it would become the first state to begin testing serum from recovered patients to treat those who are seriously ill. It's amazing how quickly this science is evolving, and it's incredible when you have so many smart people 
working on this problem. So really great news. We're going over some questions that we are getting a lot of questions right now. So we just recorded a frequently asked question, just a long list, um, not to bore you with all of those because most of those are from our patients. We're going to be posting that video and those answers on our site at wildhealth.com. One question we just got, which we thought was an important one just to discuss is someone sent in this question with the title relative risk opinion for healthcare workers. This is from a healthcare worker, from a physician we know. They said, if you have the ability to isolate yourself from spouse and young children while you continue to work on the front lines and infection rates increase, in your opinion, is the relative risk worth the sacrifice? For instance, would you send your family somewhere for a month while you continue living and working from home, knowing that you will eventually be exposed and you could become a vector? Based on all your discussions and expectations of what is to come, what are your thoughts? So this is a really good question, and it's one that uh, both Jeremy and I are wrestling with every day. We both work in the emergency room. We both have a lot of kids. I've got four. Jeremy has five, and we're thinking and talking about this every day. And honestly, this is a discussion that changes every day. For me personally, I had went from a situation to where I was only doing the occasional emergency room shift as I had completely transitioned to genomic-based personalized medicine. But now I just worked a 24 hour shift yesterday in the ER. In April, it looks like instead of maybe one or two shifts, I may have to work as many as 20 just because there's an increased need. And this is kind of a discussion that my wife and I will have um, every day going forward in the near future because the risks change every day. It's, it's something that um, on the one hand, your kids are relatively safe. Um, but relatively safe is something that as parents, we may not be completely comfortable with. And there are other people in our homes, uh, grandparents, others that we may be even more worried about. So I think for everyone, this is going to be a personal decision. It's going to depend on how easy you're able to isolate yourself somewhere. I mean, the question specifically asked about sending the family somewhere else. I think the better option would be the actual worker go somewhere else and not displace the family, at least in, in my case, it's easier for one of us to isolate than everyone else leave the home. But I think it's a great question that we're going to, it's going to change every day. I, I expect that before this is over, I may have to do that. I don't think the risk is there right now, but I could be wrong and I'm reevaluating every day. Yeah. I literally just had this discussion with my wife last night and we really were undecided. I mean, I think that the jury is somewhat still out. Uh, fortunately, we live in a relatively rural community, so we have a little bit of time to make that decision, but it's a tough one. Yeah, and I would encourage those of you out there who could help uh, to maybe help. I mean, maybe the the uh, situation is that multiple healthcare providers are uh, potentially leaving their families and staying in hotels or places close to the hospital. And the fact that no one is traveling right now, those hotels are potentially going to be empty. So if you own a hotel, it may be a great use of your facility to house healthcare workers during the pandemic when we get to a stage where that is appropriate. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, well, let's talk about the literature now. It's been a relatively quiet day from the literature front. We've got a lot of news reports, but not a ton of literature. Um, there's one article called the recommendations for the admission of patients with COVID-19 to the ICU and intermediate care units or IMCU uh, came out of the Swiss Medical Weekly. And they actually released three separate articles, but they have some very common overlying themes. Um, this article in particular provides these guidelines to determine the necessity of ICU admission. And the article recommends that ICU triage really should be determined by prognosis of improvement with ICU admission. So what does that mean? In other words, the decision of whether that patient should occupy a bed and a ventilator should be estimated on their estimated probability of survival at time of admission. That's a really difficult choice to make. Yeah. I, I didn't know you were going to, you were going to talk about this article, but, um, that is very frightening. You're talking about rationing and you're talking about some of the things that we've seen in Italy where in some regions they may not be intubating if you're over 60. And this this seems like such an un-American thing, this, the rationing of care and making those types of decisions. And, and I guess what I would say about this article is in the United States, we're not there yet. And let's not get there. Like, let's do everything we can so that medical providers aren't having to make those kind of decisions. Um, obviously the thing that we can all do, and we're going to say it over and over again, even though we've said it a thousand times is physical distancing. Um, we're working on 
slogans here to help people remember. And I think the one where we've settled on right now is if, if, if you're, if you're close enough to smell their fart, you're not far enough apart. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy. I know, I know you didn't want me to say that, but I know you're going to do it. I get, I mean, I, that was such a bleak article that I, I feel like I had to go for it and, uh, uh, just throw that at the end on some levity. We can edit it out. No, no, it's, it's not that bad. Um, honestly, the, the one good news is this is not our country. So uh, again, there's a little bit of time here and they're a little bit difficult to read, but it does kind of open people's eyes to the reality of what could be. So, you know, think positively, hopefully it doesn't ever come to that, but also think about what we can do. Yeah. And tomorrow we're going to release, uh, something tomorrow evening too. We have been working on, um, not a slogan that ridiculous, but but an actual challenge uh, for America. Um, so we're working on the, the final details of that, but we'll be pushing it out tomorrow evening. Um, but we think that we all can do more than just the physical distancing as well. So we're going to give more, you more details on that tomorrow evening. Tomorrow morning, we have a podcast with Dr. Brian Atkins. We're going to be talking about how to conserve PPE, how to reuse PPE, and what we can do to make sure that our healthcare workers aren't in a situation where they are unduly exposed and at too much risk. So tune in for that tomorrow morning. Thank you for listening and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this COVID-19 update. Please send us your questions or follow along on Instagram and Facebook at Wild Health MD. And just to be clear, this is not medical advice. No patient-physician relationship has been established and this resource is really for general informational purposes only. And finally, if you want to spread the word, please send this podcast to friends and family and give us a review on iTunes. Thanks again and stay safe.